I'm sure we'd all like to consider ourselves creative to an extent. I mean, in kindergarten, was it being creative the only actual thing we did, whether it be macaroni art or finger painting? So we all got it in us. Maybe. I mean, what even is creativity at the end of the day? The philosopher Robert Nozick explores this question in his book, The Examined Life. He starts by trying to define creativity, and then reaches some interesting considerations as a result. And that is the topic of today's video. Welcome back to Philosophy Tunes, and I want you all to comment below something you believe you're creative at. Do it right now before we go through this video's content so you can compare it afterwards. And while you're down there, you know, you could hit the subscribe button. All the cool kids are doing it. But anyways, creativity. Let's try and get a grasp on what this even means. Well, you have to make something to be creative. I think that's a good first step. And then, Nozick is going to take that and formulate our starting point definition here. To be creative is to make or do something novel. So far, so good. But to say specifically what creativity is, more details must be added. So we have our making something element, but that thing that we make must be novel. But what does it mean for something to be novel? And no, we're not talking about novels like Fifty Shades of Grey. We're talking about novel as in something new. Now something being new doesn't necessarily mean it's good. So get any ideas out of your head of creativity only resulting in good things. Nozick believes you could be creative in producing evil. So don't mistake new for good. I'm talking to you, EA Sports Gamers. Now, in terms of something being new, Nozick is going to actually turn his attention towards the creative person rather than judging if something is objectively new in the world. Whether or not there is really anything new under the sun, a creative act produces something new or novel in comparison to what that creator had encountered and known previously. So to Nozick, we look at what the creator knew ahead of time or what came before. And if they produce something new in comparison to what they already have known, then it's creative. Now, some people might be turned off by this more subjective determination of newness, but think of it this way. If you, on your own, compose an amazing song, but later find out you just wrote an exact copy of Pink Floyd's Comfortably Numb, wouldn't you still be creative? I mean, you didn't hear Comfortably Numb before composing your own song. So this thing is new to you, and it came out of your own head. The song, nevertheless, came from you through a creative process. And actually, the creative process is another element Nozick wants to add to his understanding of creativity. In any case, we won't call something creative, despite its having new and valuable characteristics in comparison to what came before, if it did not arise through a creative process. Alright, alright, so we have our producing element of creativity, which needs no explanation. Then we have our newness element, which looks at the creator and what they knew previously, and this other element talks about the creative process. But what is the creative process? Nozick defines the creative process as a process that is good, for lack of a better word, at producing new results compared to other people or their processes. An example is given of Picasso, who dies while working on a painting. So even if the painting isn't finished and is therefore not necessarily created, wouldn't we still say that while he was working on the painting, he was engaged in a creative process? It's weird, isn't it? I guess that means Picasso isn't technically creative in relation to this painting because it wasn't finished or created, but he was still engaged in a creative process while working on it. Don't be ashamed if it takes you a while to wrap your head around it either. Now whether you agree or disagree or even understand Nozick on his definition, he still has some interesting insights about creativity later on. For example, he asks this question, do we actually care about creativity though, or are we concerned about the resulting apparently new and valuable products? To help answer this question, Nozick gives a hypothetical about Beethoven. I mean, it's fair to say that society places a high value on Beethoven's work. I mean, Moonlight Sonata is something else. But Nozick asks, what if we found out that Beethoven found someone else's formula for musical composition and then applied it almost like following a Lego instruction manual? Nozick believes that even if we have that same end product, this new revelation is going to hurt our respect for the music, and I'm inclined to agree with him on this point. But isn't Beethoven a product of his genetics and social influences? His nature and nurture? In the last example, we felt disenfranchised because it wasn't really Beethoven. But is it actually Beethoven in reality? Is it really Beethoven the one making the music, or is it just his predetermined factors? Well, Nozick doesn't really answer this, but instead turns to how we might interpret the situation. 
For when it is a person's brain that generates ideas, however mechanical the explanation of how it does so turns out to be, we see those ideas as expressive and revelatory of something about the person. The resulting creative product is seen as an act of human communication, as the exercise of a human capacity for producing novelty. So this leads us to what in my opinion is the biggest takeaway from this chapter. This idea that producing creative works is a form of not only self-reflection, but self-transformation. A great example in film is through the works of directors Sofia Coppola and Spike Jones. You see, these two were married, but eventually divorced. Later, Coppola made Lost in Translation, which had themes of a dying marriage. And years later, Jones made Her, which had themes of dealing with divorce and losing someone you loved. I wouldn't be surprised if they gained new insights or understandings during this process of creating these films. Creativity itself is important, not simply the new and novel product, I conjecture, because the personal meaning of such creative activity is self-transformation in the fullest sense. Transformation of the self and also transformation by the self. Now remember when I told you guys to comment below something that you're creative in? I want you to return to that and think about a creative product that you created. I want you to reflect on yourself before and after creating that product and see if you notice any difference, any self-transformation as no success. Now, you're totally free to disagree with him. You might have written a poem and you felt the same before and after writing it. For me, I think about it a little bit longer term. This channel, for instance, is something I create, and I didn't really know another cartoon-style philosophy channel at the time of creating it. And yes, I became aware of the Coca-Cola to my RC Cola later on. But I gotta say, after more than a year at this thing, I feel like I've changed as a result of the channel. Maybe then we should add in an element of time, but who knows. Maybe you felt transformed just after one creation. Well anyway, I hope you got some value out of this video. If nothing else, try creating something, and seeing for yourself if you feel transformed by it. If you enjoyed the video, then consider subscribing to help out the channel. And I wish you all a beautiful rest of your day.